Hi, my name is Sascha Dittmann and today I would like to show you in fast and easy way how to set up an experimental Spark cluster on Microsoft Azure at a very low cost and yeah, pretty fast. To be able to do that, I first need to install the Azure Distributed Data Engineering Toolkit. To do that, I prepared already a Python 3.x environment and I'm going to use the pip tool to install the toolkit. So just pip install a set tk. So it's collecting the stuff and installing the toolkit. So done. So the toolkit is installed. The next thing I would like to do is select a folder and initialize the toolkit. This creates some hidden folder and files where you are able to store the credentials and store some default values for the Spark cluster, for the SSH environment and so on. To do that, I'll use the new tool and uh, check the version for a second. So version 0 0.8 sounds good and use ACTK Spark Initialize. So this creates, as mentioned, the, the hidden folder in the directory I'm currently in. The other option would be a minus minus global, global uh, to have a global directory which is valid for the whole machine. But I don't want to do that. I just want to do that for that current folder. So done. And to check that this is really there, let me change to that folder dot a set tk and have a look in there. Right. So cluster yaml, some XML files which are typical for the for the Spark cluster, as well as the file or yeah, the file I would like to change, the secrets.yaml, where all the important information are stored in to be able to use that tool and don't have to log into Azure and so on. So I'm going to use Vim to get in there. And as you can see, we've got two options. Option one is having a service principle, which is set up in the cloud and controls everything I need to control. The other option is more or less creating the resources on a manual base and then I can have a shared key for my Azure batch account. That's the service which is used to spin up that cluster as well as a storage account and so on. But I'm going to go for the service principle road. To do that, I need to switch back to my Azure portal and use the Azure Cloud Shell. So click on that symbol up here, my Cloud Shell it's being booted and connected. If you haven't set up or used the Cloud Shell before, it will ask which environment you want to use. I, I've chosen Bash. And the second op thing which has probably been asked is if you haven't set up that before, you need to set up a, a Blob storage account or an Azure storage account to be able to store and wrangle with the data. So that account which is used when I type in LS, so my Cloud Drive in here. <clears throat> So up next, I'm going to the ASET TK page and just copy that command. The URL for that or the whole command uh, is something I'm going to post in my blog post where that video will be embedded on, as well as in the notes on the on the YouTube channel. So just copying that command and press return. So it's installing some dependencies. So in behind the scenes, it will use pip to install some stuff. And as soon as this is installed, it will run the actual account setup bash script. And this will create in the end three resources. One is an Azure batch account, which is free, free of charge as long as I don't have any pools in there. The second one is an 
more or less empty storage account, which is used to store data, to be able to have a central storage for, I don't know, my files. So you can use Azure files, for example, to be able to yeah, share data scripts and so on above all my cluster nodes. And last but not least, the service principle I would like to use to, yeah, to be able to log on. Since I'm using several tenants, so several Azure Active Directories in the end, it will ask me now which one to choose. To find that out which one I'm currently using, I can go to my Azure Active Directory. So that's the one I'm currently using. Go to, where is it, properties. Here we go. And there is a value called directory ID, and that's the one I'm currently using. So that's fine for me. Just copy that one and paste it in. Oh, no. Tenants, there was a T in there. So here we go. Next, it will ask me for the Azure, Azure region. I would like to set that up in West Europe. The name for the resource group, since this is a, a name which is only unique in my Azure subscription, so I'll take the default value. And now comes the storage account name. It suggests ASETK storage, which is obviously, or in most cases, already taken. So I will use a hopefully unique name, ASETK. Let's do this cloud block. Then the name for the batch account. So that's unique for my subscription as well, but I will also use ASETK cloud block. And then the name of the application which is created in my Azure Active Directory. So we'll choose the default, which is fine. The name for the credentials, ACTK is fine as well. And the name of the service principle, so I'll also pick the default one. And now the script runs and creates all the resources in Azure, which is necessary to use the Azure Distributed Data Engineering Toolkit. So I'm back from the paused video. And as you can see, all the resources in Microsoft Azure has been created. And the interesting parts are the credentials to log in to my environment has been posted on the Cloud Shell screen. So I'll mark that, copy the resources, move back to my file, go into edit mode and paste it in there. So up next, delete the duplicate lines and save the file. So the next thing I can do is, yeah, try out if everything's working. ACTK Spark cluster list. So give me all the clusters which are currently in there. So looks good. So pretty empty, no clusters. So the next thing I can do is, yeah, spin up my first cluster. For that, I'll use the a set tk command again, spark cluster and create. This would spin up a cluster with exactly the defaults which are stored in the cluster.yaml file. So I would like to overwrite some of those values. For example, specify my own cluster ID. I'll call it my cluster and I would also overwrite the size of or the, the amount of the machines, especially the amount of the dedicated machines. Dedicated machines would mean that I have standard virtual machines which I own and I pay the full price for. And initially in that video I said I want to set up a low cost 
cluster. So I specify zero dedicated machines. But instead of using dedicated machines, I would like to use low priority virtual machines, which mean that I pay only 20% of the original price. But on the other hand, as soon as somebody else would like to pay the full price and Azure needs those virtual machines, those resources, it will just shut down my machines and move them to the people who want to pay the full price. And that's why I initially said this is for experimental purposes only, because I can't rely on all of those machines. If I would like to do that, I can specify, of course, some of the dedicated machines as well as additional low priority virtual machines. And those, this mix would at least don't shut down or crash my whole cluster because work will move to the dedicated machines as soon as some of the low priority machines will shut down and try to spin off additional low priority VMs. So let me first specify priority machines and I want to have two of them. And I also want to specify the type of machines since I think the default value is standard A2 or something. And I want to have a, oops, nope. Cancel that one, try that again. Standard D12 V2 machines. So that looks good. And I haven't specified an SSH key in my file, in my secrets YAML file. And that's why it's asking for a password for the virtual machines. And so I specify a password. The Spark user, by the way, or the username Spark is as well defined in those YAML files. So I can change that if I want to. So specify the password and now it's spinning up my cluster. And when I now go to asset tk spark cluster list, I should see, yeah, my first cluster activating. And as you can see, currently zero nodes are allocated and it's requesting two. I can also have a deeper look what's happening in that cluster, so I can go not to list, but to get with the ID of my cluster. So I see it's trying to spin up two low priority VMs. So I'm going to pause the video as soon and uh, yeah, resume it as soon as uh, the cluster is spun up. And I'm back. So while the cluster was provisioning, I also moved to a different machine to avoid those annoying warning messages with the return type of the HTTP calls. Yeah, but anyway, so my cluster is up and running and as you can see, it contains currently two nodes with some IP addresses, some public IP addresses and the related ports. And the first one is currently the master of that node and there are no dedicated machines. So now I'm able to, for example, SSH into that machine. To do that, I use again the asettk command, spark cluster ssh and the id of my cluster. And what it also does while connecting to the <clears throat> to the Docker nodes. It also provides some port redirections and I'm using the first one. 
moving to my browser. So I'm able, as you can see, to log into the Sparkmaster as well. And there's also a plugin concept to install things like Jupyter notebooks and so on on that cluster by default. Uh, but I'm going to cover those functionalities in a, in a later video. So back to my cluster nodes, I'm connected to the master node, can ls and see what's happening on the machine. And of course, exit back to my local machine. So the next thing I would like to do is submit the job. So I prepared already a command, which is ACTK Spark Cluster Submit. The ID of my cluster, the name of my application, which I'm going to spin up, and yeah, the path to a Python file and some arguments of that Python file, which is calculating P, but yeah, that doesn't matter anyway. So submitting that command. And as you can see, the whole standard out, standard error is uh, published to my machine. So it executed the Python script on the two executors, yeah, showing the result that P is roughly 3.14 and so on. So yeah, should increase the argument to have a more precise p-value calculation. But yeah, that was just for demo purposes. And last but not least, to close that demo, I can also, or should, delete that cluster as soon as I'm done. Deleting that cluster to confirm my deletion. It wants my cluster ID again. Deleting the cluster and uh, yeah, let me check what's happening. So getting the cluster ID should, yeah. So you see that currently there are two nodes and it's aiming to set them to zero, which will yeah eventually delete that cluster. So I hope you had a good idea now, or you have a good idea now, how to, yeah, spin up a cluster with a two kit. And uh, yeah, hope that helps you a little bit. And I'm going into more details about that two kit as well as what you can do with that cluster, Jupyter notebooks and so on. Yeah, in a later video. So thanks for listening.